All right. <laughs> okay, I'm started. All right. So I hope I picked the right 10 minutes worth of information. <laughs> Here we go. So water rights, um, big sky area information. I'm not going to do a lot of basics, but I do want to just to get us all on the same page. Montana is in the Western Doctrine states where you're first in time is first in right for water rights. So all water rights are based on a priority date system, which is um, compared to the Eastern Doctrine, which is rip or the Riparian Doctrine, where if you can access the water, you can use it. So we get a lot of people that move here from the East that get confused about that. So that's just something I want to make sure we're all on the same page with. Um, you have to have a priority right, a priority date to use the water. Um, access alone does not guarantee you any water rights. So with that, I thought I'd start big picture in Montana. All the this is the map of Montana, and all those colors and dots and lines means a closure of some sort. So um, water supply in Montana is getting to where it's mostly all allocated. Really, it's uh, People have been appropriating water since the 1860s, and so like the Upper Missouri closure, um, which is broken out into the um, Upper Missouri and then the Jefferson and Madison basins. That was in the 90s. That was when it was deemed that there was no surface water available anymore for appropriation. So we've got quite a few closed areas in the state, and then I'll just say even some of our open areas now have months where water is no longer legally available. So I see that both, we cover Park County, so both the Upper Yellowstone and the Shields have months of no legal availability. So to zoom in to our area that we're talking about, we've got the, the um, Upper Missouri Basin closure and the Jefferson Madison closure. We also have the Yellowstone Control Groundwater Area. That's that cross-hatched area uh, that affects groundwater use. That was put in place with the National Park Service Compact to protect the, uh, the geothermal hydrological resources in the park. And then also um, an effect in this area, though not necessarily a closure, is the U.S. Forest Service Compact. So with that in mind, you know, we're in a, a basin that's closed to surface water, and on this picture you've got the Forest Service coverage as shown here. So you can see how, where you sit, um, you're kind of here in the Big Sky area, we're up flow, and if you look in the Gallatin Valley, all of these green polygons are, are irrigated acreage that was mapped in the 50s for the Water Resources Survey. So that all, there's all of that downstream demand that was put in place. And if you look in the Big Sky area, there's a couple little green dots, but that's about it, not much, right? And then same on the Madison. The Madison side's got some, some irrigation, historical irrigation as well. So that's just kind of painting the picture. You've got a lot of, of water rates downstream that you have to take into account <coughs> when water's being looked at up here. And then for an even bigger picture here on the right, um, Canyon Ferry location I put, I, did, I, did, I couldn't get a really quick good map showing all the uh, hydropower dams that are below Canyon Ferry. So I just showed where you're at, where, ca where Canyon Ferry's at. And, and that's kind of, those are the limiting factors that the, hydro, the hydropower dams are, are what ended up in, resulting in the closure of the basin. It was the, the largest factor, although not the only one. So hydropower demands um, have to be looked at. And, and Canyon Ferry was put into place to mitigate, I think, Clark Canyon Reservoir. And there still is water available in Canyon Ferry. And I'll talk more about that a little later. So here's just a map showing kind of water right density. You've got the water right diversion points, or what those points are in this map. And this is a little bit better representation of where the Yellowstone control groundwater um, area, so it's on the other side of the river here, is in location. So just to talk about the area water rights, uh, there's 638 active water rights in the area. I just pulled together some quick statistics here. 120 statements of claim. Those are the historical water rights. Um, 43 permits. 444 groundwater certificates, or the exempt wells, as they're also called. And then 19 exempt notices. And then water reservations. And then the U.S. Forest Service compact rights. 
And then there's also some pending water rights. I listed those as well. So just to give you kind of a, an idea of what the historical water rights look like here, because that's really where you will have, where, where one could possibly find mitigation if they're not needed for their original use. That's where mitigation water comes from in a closed basin, our old water rights, because there's no new water available since it's closed. And I said it was closed to surface water. Um, and then, in effect, in 2005, the Smith River decision changed our policy from groundwater being well if the cone of depression intercepts surface water then that groundwater is not available or it counts towards the closure to where all groundwater is connected to surface water and so thus groundwater uses have to be mitigated drop for drop essentially so that changed in 2005 so in the in the old claims in this area as you can see irrigation is typically where you have the the most water available uh, for mitigation, and there aren't a lot in this area. I mean, that's that's what makes these mountain area developments a little more challenging in a closed basin versus a, a valley area development that's got, as your land use changes, the water can be changed to mitigate new uses. So just kind of a breakdown of some of the permits. Um, a lot of these got in before the closure. Some of them were caught in that Smith River, I mean, before the Smith River decision. Um, some were caught in that and then had to come up with mitigation kind of after the fact. Um, and so Moonlight Basin is in the list. Kelso Mountain Club, Big Sky Water Sewer District, Boyne, Spanish Peaks. And then just to talk briefly about groundwater certificates, we don't... Um, the Supreme Court ruling did come out and it upheld uh, the definition that the district court put us under, that 1987 rule, which is any um, anything that's part of the same project. And so we're kind of right now, we're in status quo. For those of you who uh, know it all about combined appropriations, I'm not going to get into that in detail. But in effect, any, any new subdivision only essentially gets one exemption for that whole subdivision. So that's 10 acre feet of water that has to be used to supply whatever that new subdivision needs for the exemption that doesn't have to go through permitting. And so that's a limiting factor. We're seeing that in the valley. Um, they're trying to squeeze in as many lots as they can under a 10 acre feet exemption. So, but prior to that, our rule was physically manifold. So every lot could have its own well and it wasn't limited to a number. So that was a big change for us in 2014. So all lots that are in existence so far prior to October 2014, we're still seeing as under that 93 rule, whereas anything that comes in after that is under our new rule and has to be looked at as a project. And then I just threw out, a, you know, the Big Sky Water and Sewer District portfolio of water rights. I mean, you know, taking a look at those that, you know, Ron knows what they are. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> it's a complex thing when you get larger, larger water suppliers. Okay, so summary of active water rights. Um, I was just making a point here. Uh, you know, adding water rights together can sometimes be useful, but sometimes not. You just really have to know what that water right is. Like in-stream flow rights are for different sections of the same river, so it's not like there's 1,800 CFS on the Gallatin. It's, you have to, legal availability and looking at water rights amounts is, is very um, water rights specific. So there's not, it, it's a challenge. Legal demands can be a challenge to analyze. So just a quick summary on the Gallatin side, uh, closed basin. Um, the water commissioner on the West Gallatin starts cutting water at 1890, 1890 priority date. So in reality, anything over 1890, all the water rights between 1890 and 1973 are essentially high flood rights. So that water is pretty much all accounted for, even though there is an exception to basin closure for high spring flows. And then um, fish, wildlife, and parks in-stream flow rights are not always met. And that they're really, those, those in-stream flow rights are becoming kind of indicators of, of where flows are in a lot of rivers. And we're seeing, it, that's what I'm seeing in the Yellowstone and the Shields as well, is they're not always met. 
And so there, you know, mitigation, I mean, Boswick is a special case. That's not something that is going to apply to everyone. So mitigation uh, using Gallatin Valley water for mitigation in Big Sky is, is still a, it's a big challenge. And then on the Madison side, um, it's Madison River is dam regulated, so it's not quite as contentious as with Gallatin. The high spring flow exception has been used in the past with Canyon Ferry, having some mitigation water for that. Um, but the changes have occurred in policy. I'm not sure if that would go through. Plus, Jack Creek has a Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and Stream Flow Reservation that's not always met as well. And the t meeting the timing of a mitigation in Jack Creek is a challenge, as Kevin could tell you about. OK, so some points to ponder. Um, basin divide for surface water, is that equal to the basin divide for groundwater? Um, groundwater complexity, where is it connected? I'm on my last minute, so I'm speaking really fast. <laughs> Green infrastructure, other mitigation tools that changes up the timing, deep injection wells, uh, conservation of water, ways to stretch existing water rates, um, wastewater treatment methods. Um, a lot of the permits up here were before the Smith River ruling where you had to define your consumption amounts, so there's maybe some flexibility there. Anne's going to talk about planning. I just like to, to preface with one of my favorites out of Henry's Fork where they 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 defined a desired condition that is a combination of science and values that all the stakeholders agreed on and use that in their planning and, and funding prioritizations. Um, so that's a great example, but Anne will talk more about planning. And then some additional resources. And I have all these up on our resources page. All right, perfect. And